In our discussion today, the topic I was asked to address uh, by this wonderful group and congregation is the discussion on the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, himself and his approach to mental health. And you might think, SubhanAllah, what is this connection? Is there something from the Prophet وسلم, himself that talks about mental health? Is this term even found at the time of the Prophet وسلم? What is this, how do you translate this word into Arabic exactly? And do they have something like mental health or psychology or psychiatry in that time? And subhanAllah, this is a long discussion and I'll give you the nutshell kind of, uh, you know, in a nutshell kind of explanation to say that the, the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, inspired an entire generation of people and generations after them, including ourselves, this many centuries later, to really um, take care of all aspects of health. This concept of health or siha is something that actually the, that Islam Right, directly from within Islam, says that there should be no distinguishing or discrimination between any one of the sorts of, or the facets of health. Not physical health, not mental health, not emotional health, not spiritual health, all of which are equally important. And so for anybody who's thinking still, hmm, I don't know, I don't know, Dr. Anya, mental health seems to be kind of like this new age thing, or are you sure it seems kind of a, I don't know, maybe a kind of more of a modern construct. Was it really something part of Islam? Is it really something part of the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his sunnah, his blessed sunnah? Well, let's explore this together, inshallah ta'ala. So this is where I'd like to begin. You know, some of you know that I love to speak about history, but I'm not going to bore you about history today, inshallah. <laughs> Although I find it very exciting, alhamdulillah. But what I will tell you about is directly about him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of the most important things that we understand about the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets. Now listen closely to this, okay? Think about this. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a message to humanity, it is very easy for Allah azza wa jal to send down that message directly to us. It could have been in the form of a book. It could have been in the form of tablets. It could have been in the form of any sort of scripture that comes. But he brought his message with a messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you could have said, maybe that's sufficient. We will learn the Qur'an, literally the scripture, the living example of the Qur'an through the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A walking Qur'an, as we say. But in addition to that, he also sends a community, sahaba and sahabiyat men and women around the Prophet وسلم, to live life, everyday life, so that whatever happens with them, good and bad, whatever good happens and whatever mistakes happen, he وسلم, can explain to us what is appropriate according to the Qur'an and what isn't. You see? Because he himself, as the most perfect of all human beings, the most blessed of all human beings, the best of them, khayri, khalqillah. He's not going to make the kind of mistakes, right, that ordinary individuals will, but the companions, men and women, may. And so we'll learn, right, through his, right, through his sunnah, through his sayings, through his actions, and what is accurate and what isn't. You take all of this together, the Qur'an, the sunnah, and the examples of the righteous, that were all there at the time of the Prophet وسلم, that then inspire the next generations, and you start to understand the story of mental health. Let me tell you how. Let's start with the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Many times when people think about mental health, they think about difficulties. They think about words like depression or anxiety. They think about trauma. They think about diagnoses. They think about maybe even medications, or maybe they think about a label that someone puts on them, or their children, let's say. How did the Prophet وسلم, himself deal with his difficulties? That's the question. Because he is the best of all of creation, and human. Human, meaning there were times that things were rough, there were times that he cried and grieved. 
There were times that he was frustrated and things were difficult. There were times where things did not go his way, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And through his example, and later I'll get to the next layer out, the example of the companions, we learn quite a bit about how you deal with trials and tribulations and your mental health, your mental well-being. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a year that was very difficult for him. So much so and so prolonged that the scholars of Sira, those who kind of captured everything related to his life, called it what? Does anyone remember? Aam al huzn Literally, Aam, a year of sorrow, a year of grief, a year of prolonged sadness. Why is this important? When I tell people sometimes that are going through something difficult, and I say, this is rather human, but it doesn't just sort of mean that you twiddle your thumbs and sit around and say, you know, if Allah sent it to me, then it shall pass. Of course it will, because Allah has also said that if he sent you difficulty, he will send you ease. Inna ma'al usri yusra. And it's repeated a second time. Inna ma'al usri yusra. And whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats something twice in the Qur'an, it means, pay attention. This is important. And therefore, I'm repeating it. And when we talk about difficulty, people think, well, how is ease with difficulty? Because it's not after difficulty comes ease. It's literally what? Ma'a. It's with. Literally tucked, un tucked into the difficulty is your ease. But sometimes you can't see it right away. And sometimes that ease isn't the thing itself, but rather circumstances around it. People, individuals, resources, just the ability to deal with something heavy, emotionally. All of these are forms of yusra, right? And so look at the Prophet وسلم, in this year of prolonged sadness and difficulty. Let's count together what happens. Who knows the seed well? How does it start? What's the first thing? There's a series of losses that happen. What's the first loss? Hmm? I'm hearing different things. So I'm hearing his wife. His wife, Sayyida, Sayyida Khadija radiallahu anha, right? This is his wife of so many years, the mother of all of his children up until this point, and right, his blessed companion, his anchor, beautiful description, wallahi, beautiful description. Yani in home, internally, this is his anchor. We would call her his internal support. Yani when you're terrified and you're running off the mountain and you're literally trembling as it's described in the Qur'an and she is there to hold you, to support you and to remind you that Allah does not want bad for you. After all these years of support, who's given you all of this, what? Emotional sustenance and support and has literally given all of her wealth for the da'wah right, for Islam, and has given all of her support to you, she passes away. It's heavy. It's heavy. And soon after, what happens? The next loss. Yes, mashallah, we have some Sita experts here. The loss of his uncle. What's his name? Abu Talib. Why is he important? Why is he important? What is the role that Abu Talib plays for the Prophet وسلم, and for Islam? And you say, for Islam? We don't know him to be Muslim. There's some khilaf. But let's just say that there's, we don't know him publicly, visibly, to be Muslim. So why is he so important? Yes. Exactly. While his uncle was alive, the people of Quraysh, the enemies, could not touch the Prophet وسلم. He was protected. So you have an internal protection and anchor from Sayyida from Khadija. For some reason, Sayyida Khadija, radiallahu anha. And you have an external protection from his uncle, both of whom pass away and in a very short span of time. Tell me, there's another loss that happens after that. Yes, in the backdrop, there is a sanction. There is an economic boycott against the Muslims. 
meaning no trade, no in, no out. So much so that they're literally starving. In this period of time, the Sahaba would talk about how they were eating leaves. One of them said, I took in the darkness, I picked up something mushy. I didn't know what it was, it was dark. And I picked it up and I put it in my mouth and it was chewing, I just chewed it. Yani, to this level of starvation. And then there's another loss. What else happens in this year? All within weeks of each other. Hmm? Hmm. Before that, there's something. And then? We're missing something. Very good. All I know what Aliki, very good. What happens after the death of the uncle and in the backdrop of this economic boycott, the Prophet says, well, I have distant fam family that's in Ta'if. I no longer have protection of Quraysh. And they're not going to be listening to me. They're, they're, they're the people that are, you know, the important people of Quraysh are no longer listening to me. So why don't I try another set of distant family members and another tribe altogether? Maybe they'll listen. So he literally walks. Has anyone been to Ta'if, by the way? Anyone visited Ta'if? Yeah? Can you describe Ta'if? What's it like? It's 50-some it's miles, right? And what, what does it look like? It's someone said beautiful. What about Ta'if? It's very different than the other cities. It's different than Mecca. It's different than Medina. It's very luscious. Yani, it's, yes, you're still in the Arabian Peninsula, but it's very green. It's very lush. It has orchards and orchards. It's, it's so interesting. A different place, subhanAllah. And here you have the Prophet وسلم, head over there, and he starts his da'wah. He starts to call people to Islam. And he's got very specific, the heads of the tribe that he wants to reach, one by one. And he goes to them, one by one. You know what they say to him? One person says to him, what? Your Allah couldn't find someone better than you to send us? Someone else says, if you really are the prophet, then I'll be cursed. Right? The next person says, don't even try to talk to me. Basically, each one of them kicks him out. Each one of them in turn kicks him out. And so he decides, despite all of this pain, right, of people being very hum humiliating him, he decides to stay in Ta'if for a little bit longer. Why? He says, well, let me give the da'wah to the common people. Right? Their leaders don't want to listen. Maybe the commoners will listen. And then they started to actually be interested in what is this message of Islam? Do you know what happens next? The leaders get wind of the fact that the people are getting interested in Islam. So what do they do to him? They literally drive him out of Ta'if. And tell me what they do, because it's very humiliating what they do. You know this part of the story. What do they do? They, they gather the who? The children. And they literally pick up stones and pelt him with this, so much so that literally he starts to bleed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It said that his heels were so bloody from this incident of the, oh, so many stones hitting him that his foot is sticking into his sandal because of the blood, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you know when you're, when you're um, targeted like this, you're so humiliated like this, he said, I lost track of where I was. Can you imagine? You're being driven out and being pelted and pelted with stones and you're bleeding and you're kind of a little bit confused where you are. He said, I did not even know where I was until he got to a specific orchard. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do you know whose orchard it was? Yes, Adas is who's with him. It was the, the purse, the servant, their servant, subhanAllah. And he sits in this orchard on a rock, and he makes a very special dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, powerful dua. I encourage us all to learn it and even memorize it. Because in this dua, he literally says to Allah, if I've done something wrong, and this is some sort of punishment for me, then forgive me, and I accept it. But if you are happy with me, you're pleased with me, and this is basically like a test or a tribulation that I'm going through, then I accept. I accept. 
And he sees at that point what? Who? Who does he see? The angel. The angel? What angel? Sayyidina Jibreel. What is Sayyidina Jibreel coming with a message? What does he tell him? See, you said hills earlier, and there were mountains there. And he says to him, if you want, I will take these mountains and basically destroy this group of people that have humiliated you so much. And what does the Prophet say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? You said rahma, mercy. He says, maybe, it could be, that from their progeny, from their next generations, they'll be believers. So keep them. Look how merciful he is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, despite the agony. Despite the agony. And there's a beautiful next part of the story, and I didn't mean to go all the way into the story of thought if I love the story of thought. <laughs> but there's a next part of the story, which is, I'll just share very quickly. SubhanAllah, where is, the, where is the yusra tucked into the usr here? He's sitting in an orchard, and the orchard belongs to people who are technically enemies, right? But he's sitting there, and the people see him, and he's bleeding, and very di- it's a very difficult, yani, it's like they had some shafaqa for him, right? They had some, you know, empathy for him. And so they, said, they sent their servant to him, and they said, give him some grapes from the orchard. Right? Remember I told you orchards, right? So when, he, when, he see, when, he, when he's offered these grapes, he says, bismillah. And the servant who listens to this, he says, who taught you to say this? And he says, I am a prophet of God. I am taught this the way Allah has taught the prophets. And so he says, the servant says, I haven't heard anyone in these lands say these words. And he says, well, where are you from? Do you guys know where he was from? From your city? MashaAllah. MashaAllah. How beautiful. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And he said, I too... I'm a descendant of which prophet? Sayyidina Yunus. And I am a prophet just like the prophet Yunus. And we are both given a message from the same God. Do you know that that servant right there took his shahada and became a Muslim? People don't know some of the little finer details. But that was, he hoped for Ta'if to become Muslim, but he had this one person. And he said, with this one person, it was the weight of that entire current city that later, alhamdulillah, I had a chance to visit Ta'if. Sounds like you did too, mashallah. They are the most generous, beautiful people you'll meet, subhanAllah. And they are core, like, like very proud believers of Muslims today. And generous, generous. <laughs> they still have the orchards and they're very generous, subhanAllah. And you think about, had that whole city been annihilated, there wouldn't have been those believers today. But let's go back to our story. Here's the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's had what? Multiple losses, one after another, after another in his life. And you're right. You mentioned something that happens right after this in the seerah. What is that? Al-Isra wal Ma'raj. This is the night journey, right? And the ascension happens right after this incident. Allah is giving him relief after these difficult moments and things that he's been through, subhanAllah. As he goes through these difficulties, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we learn from him and from all of the stories that he grieved, that he cried, that he felt a sense of even being in that confusion and, and almost like everyone is against you, and he physically bled and hurt. Why do I share this? Because when you think about the discussion on mental health, and you think about person's well-being and mental wellness, we turn first to the Prophet ﷺ. What is it that we don't see? We don't see somebody turning after some difficulty, turning against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't see somebody saying, why me? We don't see somebody saying, I can do this completely on my own. Hmm. That last point is very important. Because we talked about how the Prophet ﷺ had his internal anchor, his ex- external anchor, and he had his community. And he went and tried to seek out support from the leaders who wouldn't listen to him, but he was trying because he knew that you don't do this alone. See, today we have a little bit of a trouble with this. 
a lot of us believe that we can do things completely on our own. We think that we need to be self-sufficient. We need to be able to wipe away our own tears, and in fact, we maybe shouldn't even have tears in the first place. And that's just simply not the message of our Prophet or the Prophets of the Qur'an. Do you know my best example of this? You must know my best example of this. Who am I referring to in the Qur'an? Sayyidina Yaqub. What about Sayyidina Yaqub in the Qur'an? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described very eloquently and specifically the crying and the tears of Sayyidina Yaqub. What did he say? What's the verse? He did say that. Tamam. And how does he say his crying specifically? It's amazing. The fact that the description of the crying of Sayyidina Yaqub, the father of Yusuf, on the loss of his son. His loss of his son, right? This is the part of the story early on in the surah, right? The whole surah reads like a story, subhanAllah. And early on, we see that the loss of Sayyidina Yusuf, the brothers are jealous of him. They put him in, they can't get themselves to kill him, although they think about murder, subhanAllah, what jealousy can do to you. And instead, they put him in the, the well. They come back and complain to their, or they report to their father as though he was dead. Sayyidina Yaqub has a sense, a feeling, that something's not right. But nevertheless, even as a prophet of God, who's receiving revelation from God, he's what? He cries. I want to ask you something. Would we ever say that Sayyidina Yaqub is any less of a prophet because he cried? Would we say that he's any less of a man because he cried? Would we say that he's any less of a believer because he cried? Hasha, you can't. There's no way. And not only does he cry, I don't mean just some tears. I'm talking about the kind of tears and crying that's described in the Quran as his eyes went white with grief. And the scholars debate, was this blindness or was this more like a haziness the way cataracts might do to you? Whatever it is, the point is, the word in Arabic is His eyes went white with grief. Yeah, and he's so much crying and for a prolonged period of time. Do you know from the time Sayyidina Yusuf was lost until he was found or reunited yani, with his father, how many years was that? Does anyone know? How many years? It's, it's a few decades. Some say between 20 to 30 years before he's reunited with his son. That many years of crying. It'll do it to you. What do I want to say? We would never say here's a prophet of God after the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Our understanding of who are the best humans are the prophets. The most cl closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here is a prophet of God who is crying so much. Why do I really emphasize this? Because, forgive me, but I'm going to put something there that you may not be happy with me, but especially our boys and our men, what do we say to them? Be a man. Don't be a girl. Men don't cry. Man up. Hmm. Would you say that to Prophet Yaqub? I'm not trying to say, and let everybody start crying, <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. But what I am trying to say is tears have a purpose, and tears have a place, and tears are something that is not considered to be the opposite of a believer. This point is very important. Because for so many people, when we talk about mental health, the immediate thing is, well, if they just had better Iman, they wouldn't have mental health problems. Would you say that about Prophet Yaqub or the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? You have a whole entire am al huzn a whole year of sadness, of grief, of sorrow. Would we say this to them, that their iman wasn't strong enough? No. So what do we mean then? It means that it's possible that a person can have very strong belief in Allah and be an immense pillar of belief, but
mics sometimes don't like me. That's okay. They are going to start crying too very soon. <laughs> and here's my proof for you. The Prophet ﷺ says about believers, right? He says about believers that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted good for you, he's going to test you. Because the best of all people are the prophets and they are the most tested. And after them are the people who are the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are the most tested after the prophets. And so on and so forth. And people have a really hard time with this, but it is part of our tradition. It's part of our Islamic concept. For example, the Prophet وسلم, says, من يرد الله بي خيرا يصب منه. What does that translate to? Whoever Allah intends good for, he sends them affliction that benefits them. Sometimes these difficulties are a purification. Sometimes these difficulties are a reminder. Sometimes it's a prick that kind of says, okay, what is this? Or maybe it's a humiliating and humbling experience to say, I need to get help. I shouldn't and can't do this completely on my own. And I think that's really important because so many times I talk to individuals who they themselves have gotten to a point where they realize, I need help. And they'll say to members of their family and their community, their friends, and they'll say, I think I need some help. But often they're met with resistance. No, you don't. Just pray more. No, you don't. Don't be so lazy. You know, get up, get up. No, you don't. If you just did X, Y, or Z, you'd be fine. But this isn't the message of our deen. And it's not the message of the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, you want to know what is the message? <laughs> I'll tell you. There were times in the Prophet's life himself, ﷺ, that he wanted so much to spread Islam, to give this message of da'wah, that he wanted everyone to be part of the fold of Islam. But there were some who were resistant and they just weren't going to listen. SubhanAllah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked to him or addressed him directly in the Qur'an. And he says to him, as an ayah that you all know and probably recite weekly, but let's think of the context in which it's revealed. فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعٌ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِنْ لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَىٰ Are you familiar with this verse? You recite it. You know it. What is it? Let me translate it to you. It says, Now perhaps, O Prophet, you will grieve yourself to death. Okay, listen to me. Grieve yourself to death over their denial if they continue to disbelieve in this message. Allah is saying to him, there is a limit of what you can do and of convincing other people about this message. Even if they don't listen, you can't basically put yourself in a situation where you will grieve so heavily and so deeply that it'll start to affect you psychologically and physically. So Allah puts a limit in place of how far you can go before you have to address this. Do you see what I'm saying? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, Do not grieve yourself to death over him, O Prophet. Yani, remember that even the Prophet وسلم, as a human, yes, the best of all humans, was prone, was prone to going into a state of grieving so extensively that it could be problematic. So Allah is telling him, don't go that far, right? So I have five messages for you, or five main aspects of when people want to know, what is the Prophet Muhammad wasallam's approach himself to mental health? Let's say all five. Number one, the first and foremost, that suffering can be that blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for somebody who does not believe in Allah and doesn't understand the concept of um, a God-centered kind of concepts or of worldview where you realize that you are not the one in charge. There is Allah's divine wisdom really orchestrating everything. It's hard to understand this concept. Why would you have somebody who's going to have a suffering be a blessing? But here's my proof for you. There's a hadith where the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, says, عَجِبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ إِنَّ أَمْرُهُ كُلُّهُ خَيْرٍ that the, the wondrous, it's wondrous, the believer. 
all that happens to the believer is khair, is good. All that happens is good. And he emphasizes that this is not for anybody except for the believer. That if Allah gives them good, then alhamdulillah, it's good for them. But if he gives them difficulty, then what? Also alhamdulillah, exactly. That if, it, that if the good, the gratitude, the prosperity comes to them, then they have shukur. They're in gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if the difficulty comes to them, the adversity befalls them, they endure patiently. And this is also good for them. Only a believer can understand this. And only a believer can have the kind of patience to kind of push them through or pull them through this difficulty when it comes to them. Number two, to embrace this knowledge of your emotions in balance. Like the message I was saying earlier about the Prophet ﷺ. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put limits to the da'wah that he was doing. That it can't be a point where it drives him into the ground, essentially. Right? Even the da'wah of Islam. And so here, this idea of balance, the Prophet ﷺ taught us the importance of acknowledging our own emotions. And people think this is so interesting, that this is really the Prophet told us about our emotions, yes. Not only did he وسلم, acknowledge his own emotions, but he acknowledged the emotions of the people of his community. And there are many examples of this, but let me tell you the story, which is a difficult story, but an important story. And it comes later in the Prophet's life, and now he has the youngest of his children, a son, by the name of Ibrahim. And Ibrahim was not to live. He was not going to live very long. And as he's literally taking his very last breaths, he's sitting on the lap of his father, the Prophet ﷺ. And this little child is taking the very last breaths, and the Prophet ﷺ begins to cry. Visible tears coming down his cheeks. So much so that the companions see the tears. And so they ask him, because they're curious. They want to know everything the Prophet does, everything he says, everything he does, everything they have to understand. Is this okay? Is this not okay? What do we do? What does this mean? So they ask him about the tears. And this is what he says. Indeed, the eyes shed tears, and the heart feels sorrow. But we do not say that except which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surely, your departure, O Ibrahim, leaves us all deeply saddened. And he explains to the companions, tears are normal. They're normative. There is what, this is what Allah has given us to grieve with. It's different. Crying is different than wailing and screaming and carrying on. But tears and being overcome by emotion and the feeling of sorrow and grief in your heart is human. And if you don't have this, then you're a robot. And he shows through his own blessed example, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that not only is it okay to cry, but a believer cries. But what they don't do is push against or say something that Allah would not be okay with. Does that make sense? It's so important when he says, and we do not say except that pleases Allah, means I don't complain about what Allah has given me. I don't push, I don't have i'tirad. I don't push against the fate that God has given me. He's taken my young son away. Some might say, why me? How come? Why not him? Why not her? I understand that this has come to me, and so I accept it. But it does not negate that I can be tearful and sad. Does that make sense? This is important. This balance, this is what I mean by balance of emotion. Recognizing emotion. See, sometimes as modern humans, what we do is we start to label emotions. We say sadness and tears, bad. Happiness and joy, good. We don't realize that the entire spectrum of emotions is something Allah created. 
He created sadness just like he created happiness. And therefore, all of which are the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can't label some of them good and some of them bad. Does that make sense? And this balance is part of his prophetic example towards mental health. Number three, to regulate our emotions. The prophetic example on mental health here is a regulation of emotions. Think about a hadith that you know, I know you know this one, about anger. What does the prophet say? Anger is an emotion Allah has created. And put in the right direction, it could actually lead to good. Put in the wrong and to an extreme situation, it can definitely lead to bad. What is the hadith that you know about anger? La taqatub. Tell me more. What else do you know about anger? What happens if you're angry? What is the prophetic sunnah to do? Ah, good. Excellent, excellent. You're saying all different parts of the hadith. Excellent. But if a person is standing, they sit. And if they're very, and if they feel that heat, right? What is this? This is another narration of what? That anger is from shaitan. Shaitan is made from fire. So how do you put this out? Water. So go make wudu. Right? There is a behavioral, this is in psychology, we would call this a behavioral modification to an emotion that you're feeling. Literally, you are regulating the emotions by putting, again, limits around them. You're not canceling them out and saying, nope, canceled. <laughs> you're actually modulating them, modifying them, helping them to be the best version of you, inshallah ta'ala. Number four, to take time to take care of yourself. And you'll say, really? Self-care is part of the sutta of the Prophet ﷺ? Absolutely. Sometimes people hear this word self-care, and they think I'm saying selfish. I'm not telling us to be selfish. But when I'm saying self-care, it's the same kind of care that we give to anything that we're doing. When we say self-care, I don't just mean spa days, ladies. When I mean self-care, I mean everything, all aspects of care. So if it's physical, then it's taking care of our physical bodies, whatever form of exercise that allows you to do that. When I say emotional self-care, it's regulating and working on our emotions. And if there's something that is just like physical, by the way, some people are very motivated. They say, oh, I can go run a mile, no problem. Other people, they literally need like a running group to do anything. <laughs> Some people are like, I can have the run of the machine, the treadmill in my own house, and I'll have the self-discipline to get up on it and to do something with it. Others, they'll have every machine created. <laughs> Yet what's missing is them getting onto the machine, so, mashallah. So then what do they need? They need encouragement. They need a group. Sometimes they need a trainer, right? I had this excellent trainer, subhanAllah, and a Muslim lady. She was really excellent, mashallah. And I've noticed the difference of having a trainer versus not having a trainer. You know? It's something about there is accountability. I knew that I was accountable. <laughs> I was going to show up, and she was going to ask me, right? And I had to be there. And there were certain times and certain days that I had to be on time, subhanAllah. And that level of accountability was very useful. If we do that for physical health, what about for emotional health. Okay, you're not ready to hear about emotional health? Fine. What about spiritual health? And I'll come back to emotional health. What do you do for your spiritual health? You're here. Here on a Friday night. You could be at the movie theaters. You could be at the mall. I don't know. The who? The gym. <laughs> to an extent, the gym might be okay. But it's a Friday night. You could really be literally anywhere, subhanAllah. What are you doing for your spiritual health and well-being? You're here with the Imam, mashallah. You're here in a circle of knowledge, a halaqa. You're here in a bonds of sisterhood and brotherhood that kind of uplift you and keep you going spiritually. And alhamdulillah, the many programs that you're attending, this is helping you, spiritual health. If you completely cut out all aspects of a Muslim community and a place in which you're learning Islam, you'll find this is deficient. It's just like the treadmill that can't get the person on it. Same thing with spiritual health. Now are we ready to get to emotional health? 
What happens with emotional mental health if we find ourselves unable to do this completely on our own? Some people can. They may have the resources or the family or the friends or the support, and maybe what they're dealing with is what we would call mild. Mild, on the, the grand scheme of things. Mild. But maybe for some people, their tribulation in life comes in that mental health or emotional health aspect. And maybe it's a moderate or even a severe. Even then, people say, you can do this on your own. Why? We're not superwoman and supermen. We're not. That's not how God created us. He didn't create us to fly. <laughs> he didn't create us with special superpower. He really didn't. He created us humans. And he gave us examples of people close to him who also told us to get help. You want my proof? The companions went to the Prophet وسلم, and they said to him, if we get sick, should we go get treatment? What are they implying in this question? They're asking the Prophet of God. It's as though, even though it's not said, it's as though it's implied, Ya Rasulullah, isn't prayer enough or the kid enough? They didn't say this, but it's essentially implied. Should we go get treatment? They're asking the Prophet, who, if you go to the average Muslim today and you told him, I'm depressed, he would say, <laughs> A believer does not get depressed? Go pray. This is the typical answer. What was the Prophet's answer? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tadawu. Tadawu ya ibadallah. Seek out treatments, O servants of God. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمْ يَضَعْ دَاءً إِلَّا وَوَضَعَ مَعَهُ شِفَاء Oh, in some narrations, دَوَاء. I'll translate the companions asked the Prophet ﷺ, if we get sick, should we go get treatment? And he ﷺ answered and said, seek out treatments, O servants of God. For God does not send down illnesses. He does not create illnesses unless he creates its cure. Or in some narrations, its treatment. And this is what modern medicine would tell you today. There are some illnesses that have cures and some illnesses that have only treatments. They'll, they're chronic, they won't go away, but you can treat them. And this is powerful. You know, when the pandemic happened and nobody understood what was happening with COVID-19, especially in those first few months, think about March 2020, right? For the first few months, can you put yourself back there? It's not that long ago, yeah? Put yourself back there. I don't know, none of us want to be back there. <laughs> just, for just a few months, it's just emotionally, because it's so recent history, right? I can't believe we're saying history, but anyway, it's so recent that you can put yourself back into the feeling of anguish, of just ang angst, of like not knowing what is this thing and people are dying and they're telling us to isolate and to drop everything we're doing and to stay at home. And Do you remember that feeling? This tiny little micros microscopic little virus that you can't see that brings the entire world to a standstill. And I was so wonderful to hear believers say, that if Allah created an illness, he's also created its cure or treatment. And subhanAllah would only be within a matter of months given to modern medicine, subhanAllah, and the work of people, some of whom are Muslim, by the way, right? Who figured out the vaccine for COVID, who put, right? Because the cure doesn't just fall from the sky. You have to actually take active work to make it happen. Science and, rep and, rep and lab work and kind of research and so on, anyway. The point is, the belief of knowing that if Allah sent an illness, even a brand new one we've never seen before, he's also going to send its cure or treatment. There is no discrimination in Islam between physical illness and mental illness. And if you want my proof to this, the proof are the institutions that the Muslims created. We actually named our nonprofit organization Madistan after these institutions. For those of you who know Farsi or Urdu, you know the word bimar illness, stan, location, the modest stan is the hospitals of the Muslims. The Arabic of this is Dar Shifa. Interestingly, in the Arab lands, they have the bimaristans, that's what they call them. And in the non-Arab lands, they call them the Dar Shifa. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, they're the same kind of institution. They're a hospital. 
and the hospital was run by physicians. And you know what was so beautiful by it? We're writing a book at this moment, make dua, inshallah, we're almost done with it, inshallah ta'ala, that we can't find proof of other civilizations parallel or before the Muslims that put psychiatric wards in their hospitals before the Muslims. Then you tell me that there's something in Islam that discriminates between mental health and physical health. There isn't. Yani, they had the wherewithal to say, if Allah says there's an illness, there must be a treatment, that I'm going to, whatever illness I see in front of me in society, I'm going to work hard to make sure we provide health and care for that person. So their hospitals are literally like this. A section for surgery, a section for obstetrics, a section for internal medicine, a section for ear, nose, and throat, a section for ophthalmology, a section for psychiatry. There are papers written by non-Muslims that say that that blueprint of the Muslim hospitals is the blueprint of the modern hospital system. They took it from the Muslims. Because you know what the alternatives were that were available at the time? Send them to the nuns or priests to pray on them. Or, in Europe, at the same exact time, burn them as witches at the stake. Because this is a supernatural possession that's happening to them. Do you see what I'm saying? This is not what the Muslims understood. And where are they getting it from? Tadawu, ya ibadullah. Seek out treatments, O servants of God. And lastly, number five, to seek help. This is part of the Prophet Sunnah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's himself. You already heard the hadith, but I'll tell you something very beautiful about the seerah. Now, Sitna Aisha, I get to finally say and talk about her, <laughs> that Sitna Aisha radiallahu anha, years and years after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, she outlived him for many, many years. And for years afterwards, people would come to her specifically for many things, one of which is medicine. And people are always so amazed by this. They would say, oh Aisha, we know that you are really good with your fiqh, your Islamic laws and legislation, because you lived with the Prophet ﷺ. You're an immense narrator of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So that makes sense. We know you're really good with lineages, which was very important at the time for the Arabs and until today. It's one of our maqasid actually to the preservation of the lineage. And they would say, we know that that's the case because your father is Abu Bakr, and he was very good at this knowledge. So he passed it down to his daughter. But how is it that you're so good at medicine? And she would say, because when I would get sick, when, I, when, when, when the Prophet وسلم, would get sick, all of the tribes of Arabia would try to send him different types of medicine. Right, they all want to make sure that he's okay. So everyone is giving, can you imagine, try this, try this, try this treatment, try this herb, try this thing, right? So she was a witness to all of this. She said, I learned all of the different kinds of treatments that were available at her time. And so she learned medicine. And she learned from the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, himself to give people treatment when they were ill, not just simply to make dua for them or pray for them. You do that plus you take the medicine. And that's really important. And one such example that I'll give you is a special kind of soup or kind of a meal. You call it maybe a comfort food called talbina. Do people know talbina? Some people still make it till today. Do you know what talbina is? It's barley. Yes, exactly. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you take barley flour and milk and honey, and they would make it and they would give it to anybody who was feeling down, having some anxiety or some down, uh, you know, sadness. And when the people asked her about this, why do you give talbina to these people? Because this was something she was doing. So it's an Aisha. She said, I heard the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam say, talbina helps the ailing heart cope and find rest. And it also relieves some sorrow and grief. SubhanAllah. Now, to me, the talbina itself is an interesting thing. But what's more interesting is the fact that she actually learned from the Prophet to treat depression and anxiety and sorrow and difficulty with a physical substance, not just merely dua and prayer. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? It's really important to understand that they took 
things to help them as well. And in the generations after them, because in the book that we're writing, we're looking at how did the, in that hospital that I'm telling you about, the Madistans, what did they treat? They had the psychiatric wards. How did they treat those who were mentally ill? They had actual treatments for them, including treatments that were medication-based, including treatments that were talk therapy. Mm -hmm. Yep, you just heard me right. Talk therapy. I'm not saying the Muslims created it. We still have to do more research to see if they were the first ever. But they were definitely some of the very first to work and to really help understand the benefit of something like talk therapy. That it's not just talking, 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 but it's actually learning techniques and tools to help you in healing. And the Muslims did this. And thirdly, spiritual help. When you combine the three together, medications, plus the therapy, plus the spiritual upliftment, you get a recipe for care and concern. Alhamdulillah, I can go into many, many more um, examples of, from our tradition, subhanAllah, in which the, um, the types of treatments that were used and the types of certain scholars and certain um, leaders of our historical past that actually were really... Um, at the forefront of all of this discussion on mental illness, and I'm happy to share some of those things. I do want to give some time for the Q&A, but alhamdulillah, I'll conclude with this. We had our five kind of main examples of how the Prophet wasallam dealt with mental health. And in addition, we'll say this. In this, my, my closing kind of remark here is a call to action, really, for our community. And what is our call to action? That we have a tradition that literally teaches us that in addition to making dua and making sure that we don't lose that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and continuing with strong iman, despite whatever difficulties and tribulations come our way, it is also a tradition that says, get help when you need it. Please don't stand in the way of all those who do need that help. And here I bear with, with a lot of humility, say to our community, please parents, don't stand in the way of the children that need the help. Please, husbands, don't stand in the way of the wives that need the help. Please, wives, don't stand in the way of the husbands that need help. Please, young people, don't stand in the way of the elders that need the help. SubhanAllah, at every level, and I meet so many people that come and talk to me and afterwards and they approach and they say, I know I need help, or I know so-and-so needs help, but I can't seem to move the needle. And I ask why, and they say, shame. Or if they're young, they'll say, my parent is worried that I'm not going to get married. Or they'll say, they don't want it on their insurance record. Or they'll say, is it going to go on some other academic or job record? Or they'll say, I'm not sure that I actually need this help in the first place. My concern with all of these things is all of them have a solution. None of them are, you're not making any of them up. All of them are real important things to consider. But ultimately, my concern is a decade later, two decades later, after you see the young people become older people, you see what happens is the cycle perpetuates. It just continues to perpetuate. I know people from my generation that grew up when I was growing up here, right? And now they're my age, and they have children. Mashallah, our children are teenagers now, <laughs> subhanAllah. And as we see the cycles continue to perpetuate, it's, it's, it's sad. And you think, subhanAllah, had there been intervention earlier on, what could have happened? And we don't go back and say, well, no, because لَوْ يَفْتَحْ بَابِ الشَّيْطَانِ Right? The word if opens the door of shaitan. So we're not going to say, you know, what if we got that help earlier. But what we will say is today, from today, moving forward, let's make sure that that help can happen, that the healing can happen, that we can break cycles of difficulty, and cycles that will, and will perpetuate, that unnecessarily don't need to perpetuate themselves. And I say this to people, and they're not always happy when I say it, but I say, I don't want your child or your family member 10 years from now to sit in my office and complain about you. Not because you did something, but maybe it's the lack of doing something. The lack of getting help when they needed the help. The lack of being there when they needed it. And more importantly than that is to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be asked and be said, I put you in a community and in a place and a situation where you had resources. 
and you didn't take up the resources to get the help one needed. Are you upset with me that I said this? Some might be, so forgive me, subhanAllah. But it's, it's really a year, it's, it's, a, it's, it's because of dec- literally now, alhamdulillah, been doing this work for a number of years, and it's like a number of years worth of seeing kind of a pile up of what could be avoided by actually doing the thing that we're taught to do by our own Prophet Sallallahu and our own tradition of getting the help. Clearly their madistans weren't empty. <laughs> they clearly were filled with people that needed the help. And so they created the institutions, they created the programming, they created the treatments. My friends, my sisters, my brothers, they created this. The earliest of these happened right after the time of the Prophet Wasallam. He, he ordered the very first of them to be created and the standalone institutions, the actual brick and mortar institutions from as early as the eighth century. Psychiatric wards as early as the eighth century. So, are we somewhat convinced now, inshallah? I'll end with this. Let's remember, inshallah, that all of the prophets were sent to us as role models and examples. And the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, himself was the best example of holistic well-being, balanced well-being, balanced whether it's emotional, mental, spiritual, intellectual, physical, all of it is very much balanced together. This is the tradition of our Sunnah sallallahu alayhi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and that our Muslim um, pioneers, our noble predecessors, really pioneered in this field that we today call mental health. And we hope, inshallah, that we'll have many from our communities going forward, many of you, inshallah, who are in this pipeline of really contributing to something that I believe the Muslims had a beautiful tradition and heritage of, but somewhere along the way we seem to have lost the sense of that, and it's time to revive it, inshallah, in the best way, bridging, of course, the best of modern medicine, but also understanding that we have a holistic methodology that differs than just the straight way you see psychiatry today. It needs some fixing as well, that holistic fixing that can come and lend from Islam. So the two together, I think, can be something very powerful, and I hope, inshallah, that prophetic example continues to live forward and that we're able to benefit not only the Muslims but even all of humanity. This is my dua, all of humanity. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Barakallahu fikum wa sallallahu ala al-hadi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And I'll clarify, thank you very much for the question. I'll just repeat it so that everyone can hear it as well. The question is, what happens if the person who needs the help may be the head of the family, the person who is leading the family, if you will, and, and so are you saying they're not willing or you're worried about their ego? It is. I agree with you about the challenge part. Anytime we don't acknowledge. In fact, subhanAllah, in therapy, one in, in this field, one of the first things we tell people is in order to be able to start to move the needle, one of the very first steps is acknowledgement. And you can't really go anywhere without it. If a person isn't willing to acknowledge that there is a problem or that there is help that's needed, then you're right. It's very hard to do so. So what do you do? First, there's, a, there's two points to this. One has to do with the ego and one has to do with getting the help for someone who doesn't want to get the help. I'll address the not getting the help first and then I'll talk about the ego part. Um, often, I tell people, look, there's different approaches you can take for somebody who probably needs that help. You can see the help is they need the help, but they're not willing. Maybe they're not willing to listen to you, <laughs> but there may be somebody else that they're willing to listen to. So I often say, whose support can you leverage? Do they have a brother? Do they have a father, an uncle, uh, even the imam? Somebody who that they respect, and maybe that person, when they say it to them, they hear it differently. Either saying the same thing, subhanAllah, but they hear it differently from somebody else. That they respect, that they honor, that they are able to to leverage their support. Sometimes the issue is knowledge, right? They don't realize that there's actually something related, even from within our deen, that gives the full permissibility for this and encourages this, in fact. Right? So maybe it's knowledge. Sometimes the issue has to do, as you said, with ego. And this often is much more cultural than it is anything else. But it's also this is the communities that we build. Because we cause that, subhanAllah. As in to say, if there were communities that it's much more normative, and you see this now, in fact, so many of the you know, fellow people who are, um, people who speak, you know, the shiuch and the sheikhat and the people who are ustad and ustadas, you know, I often say to them, I know that many of them are in therapy, because we have private conversations. But I say to them, if you're willing, and when you're willing, and you feel it's the right time, when you're on the microphone, say, 
even in the middle of a khutbah, in the middle of a class, you might say, and when I'm in therapy, kaza kaza, you know, so, and people are like, oh, Sheikh so-and-so is in therapy. And it's, and, but what does it do? It normalizes the conversation. Why? It makes sense that they would be. They're carrying so much stress and burden. SubhanAllah, they're carrying an entire community on their shoulders. It makes sense they would be. But somehow normalizing the conversation. Now, you'll see, especially for those who are on social media, you'll see this. You're talking about athletes, actors, entertainers, whoever. They're, if everyone's talking about mental health and therapy. It's like the new buzzword out there. And for better or for worse, it's starting to normalize the conversation a little bit. So when a person does say, a big shot person says, and I go to therapy, it's not like, ooh. It's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> they have a lot that they're dealing with. It makes sense, right? So when we start to normalize this, you start to break away some of the ego issues. So it's really about a community. We're in a community, I'll tell you this much, where I normally am on a Friday night is my own home community, my own home masjid, um, uh, where I live in California, <laughs> subhanAllah. And the Rahma Foundation, assalamu alaikum to the sisters, a lot of my halakha sisters are actually <laughs> watching online because I normally am with them on a Friday night doing our halakhas, and this is in California. And within the masjid, hint, hint to unity, <laughs> within the masjid, we literally have a therapy office. And the reason, and it's interesting, people are like, why? <laughs> why? So, because in the years that we've done this, what I have found, what I have found is that about half of our community literally will not send their children or themselves, will not go to therapy unless it's within somewhere they trust. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't go, they wouldn't let their child go anywhere else unless it was literally inside of the masjid because this is a safe space. The other half of our community wanted nothing to do with the masjid. <laughs> they didn't want anything mental health related to the masjid. They wanted it to be like in an actual medical building. So, the, so we have a medical clinic that's actually in an actual <laughs> separate building. And we needed that. We needed the two-pronged approach, and it was very important. And we found people were starting to utilize services by having these two different, or multiple different kinds of models of service. Why do I say this? The community that we created became one of mental health language. You go into the MCC today, Saddam to the MCC, inshallah, <laughs> which is our, my, my home masjid, alhamdulillah, and you'll see that the conversations on mental health is very common. Yes, okay, maybe because I give halakas every week there, <laughs> but the reality is people started to talk the language of mental health. It became much more normalized. And then you started to see the husbands, the fathers, the breadwinners start to come through. And if they weren't willing at first, you know what I do very often in therapy? I do a lot, most of my work is with women and, and uh, with women, young and old, and you know, they'll say, my husband isn't willing, my father isn't willing, etc. And I'll say, how about we do one family session? One family session. And I don't mean to trick anybody, rather it's actually very helpful for me to understand what is the backdrop. So I'll say to the husband, I need you to come to this one session because it helps me, you get to complain, you, <laughs> you get to tell me what's happening from your point of view. They're like, oh, I can complain about my wife? Excellent, I'll be there. <laughs> But anyhow, they'll come and they'll come to the session. And what it does, it gives me a sense of what's happening in the background. But more importantly, and maybe as equally importantly, it breaks the ice. You fear the unknown. You're not sure what this whole therapy thing is. But when they're there, they're kind of like, oh, is this it? This is, this is okay. Actually, I think I could benefit from this. I have so many husbands after that session say, I think I can benefit from this, that we refer them for their own session as well. Hopefully one of these aspects work, inshallah. No. There's a brother here, then we can come back, inshallah. Thank you for that <laughs> courageousness, inshallah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. So you're talking about resources as in ahead of time. Okay. Yes, yes, so this is true. And I also agree with the idea of that we wait sometimes until it's, I don't want to say too late, but it's late in the game, right? Um, so a couple of ideas. Um, I do know that there is a group in Michigan, or there is a group of mental health providers that are together. I don't know if anyone's here from that group in Michigan. Anyone here from our Michigan Muslim Mental Health Group? There is a group, mashallah. And I know that they have been pooling together the resources that are part of the Michigan 
community. So basically Metro Detroit or just all of Michigan, kind of um, who are the therapists, who are the resources. On our, um, and I, I'm leaving here some information, both the pens for you guys and the bookmarks, but on Mattis Dunn's website, this is the nonprofit that I've um, helped found, on the resources tab of our website, we actually have listed the different directories that have on it, we don't know everybody there, but we know that they're all Muslim. So we've gathered together as many Muslim mental health professionals across the U.S. as we could find. And so you'll find actually a list specifically for Michigan on there. And um, I hope, inshallah, that's useful. So that's providers. And then in addition to that, there is also the kind of resources that are just, how do you keep up with mental well-being? So one of the things I'd like to actually invite you all to do is if you're part of our mailing list, one of the things you'll find is we do every month a, uh, a mental wellness healing circle or learning circle. Learning circles are about topics on mental health. So this, this month, for example, is actually yesterday or the day before, we actually had one on men's mental health, Muslim men's mental health. It was actually specifically for that. June is related to men's, Muslim, uh, men's mental health. So that was the topic, but you can find the recording on our YouTube channel. And then sometimes when there's a crisis that happens, like across the ummah, we'll actually do a healing circle. And so those are helpful too, because it's just the moment of like being able to tap into something that kind of grounds you again. And um, we've done one just recently for Sudan, prior to that to the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria and so on and so forth, whenever there's a crisis in the Ummah. And there's many of those that happen as well. So hopefully those resources can just jumpstart being able to tap into something consistently that helps with some of the mental health and well-being. Of course. Still good? We're done. We're done, inshallah, because of Maghrib.